Hello. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Rocky. Wait, 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 wait. I have a tail. I have a tail. <laughs> Oh, this is, this is great. This is great. I'm on that note, on calls. that note. No, stay, stay there, Nicole. Stay there. we got to explain to the internet, right? Yeah, stay there. Stay there. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you might be. Thank you for being here at Code It Live. Uh, this is the How to Human show. And clearly, we are failing at, or maybe we're exceeding at being humans. We're, we're here's winning. Here's Good. 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 Nicole is winning. Yeah, Nicole is winning. So here's what we do. While the two-minute intro uh, thing is playing, none of us know what Nicole is going to come uh, dressed as. So it's her own self-imposed, uh, you know, um, you know, challenge of trying to surprise us every time. So she has to go uh, get dressed in her costume in those two minutes, and she surprises us with whatever she's up for. <laughs> so. Someday I'm going to come on, and I'm going to have tried to do like a makeup challenge, and you're just going to see it like smeared, like. To the right, to the side, I'll be like, oh no, it's time. <laughs> but anyway, yes, today is done. Today is done. Time My surprise is over, and now I will become a pumpkin because it has been <laughs> midnight. All right, folks. Uh, so let's uh, kick this off. Uh, this is the How to Human show because, you know, uh, at times it might feel like a struggle. So we are all here to just kind of learn from our shared experiences and you know, try to be a little bit more humane in, in how we live our lives. Uh, we are your hosts. I'm Sam. Uh, with me, I have uh, Nicole and, uh, and Jeff here. Uh, and we have a very, very special guest with us today. Marianne Vasev. How are you? Hi. I don't know what I got myself into after this interview. <laughs> but That's I'm, how uh, we I'm to make you feel. We just want you to feel welcome and unwelcome at the same time. It's this perfect balance of tension. It's a very human experience. I can absolutely say that. <laughs> All right, and we are, you know, on screen um, with the magic of technology. Um, you know, we are in different parts of the world. Um, Nicole, me, and Jeff are both, uh, are, all three of us are on stateside in the Americas, while Marianne is with us from beautiful Sofia, Bulgaria, and actually at our offices, looks like today. Indeed. I'm in the office. It's already dark outside, so this is already feeling very sci-fi for me, knowing that we're in different time zones. <laughs> I'm having my morning coffee, so there you go. Oh, enjoy. Thanks. It's almost wine time here, so imagine the difference. All right, so um, Marianne, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, who are you? What do you do? Well, that's a very loaded question. Let's start, let's start there in, in the sense that we'll be talking, I think, for the whole 60 minutes, I'm expecting why this is a very deceptively easy question. But I'll start with probably, you know, the front-facing thing. I'm part of Progress. I have been here for running close to seven-ish years now, and my focus is talent development, which means the, the best way I like describing this and probably just me geeking out about this is I like working as a broker of knowledge. Sometimes in those rare occasions, it's my own knowledge I got to share, but a lot of the times it's sharing other people exchange knowledge when they need it and when they have it. Uh, be that in sessions, be that in resources, this is pretty much what I do. Um, yep, I am a psychologist by background. I, uh, I have an unfinished dissertation so I'm a PhD candidate. My focus is on uh, manager effectiveness, so to speak. And also I am very passionate, I think is a good word, passionate about the topic we'll be talking about, not only being human and what that means, because it's a very fascinating topic to talk about, but also biases, which are part of us being human, I think. I just say, you sound so impressive. And I'm like, I'm wearing dinosaur pants in community <laughs> talk. <laughs> I am not a PhD candidate, but I feel maybe so, For what it's worth, I'm nowhere near flexible to show you my socks, but they have carrots on. So I have carrot socks on. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no pressure for Jeff, me, and Nicole here. It's just like casually dropping. Yeah. I have a master's degree. I'm a PhD candidate, but that's a ton Stop. of work. Uh, so good for you. And you know, um, Marianne can be described by just. Awesome, just an awesome human being. All right, so um, what are you here to tell us? You know, late on us, uh, I, I think I heard you talk about biases. Uh, I don't have any biases, like I'm, I'm perfect. Well, when you say that, yeah. 
So here's the thing with bias. I, I'm pretty sure that whoever is listening to this, be it life or after, may very well think that. And I think this is perfectly fine. Listen, I'm not here to ruin anyone's day or make anyone feel less than. I think this is the last thing you want to do when, when you talk about biases. But if at the end of this conversation, we, f- we, we wrap up with the understanding that biases are, by definition, neutral. They're not necessarily good. They're not necessarily bad. They serve a purpose, but sometimes they serve this purpose in a way that is very prone to errors. So as long as we understand that no one is immune to biases, but also that biases are, by definition, in this neutral gray zone, I think this opens up so much possibility for us to have a more level-headed, curious conversation about what is the role they play, why they play it, and how sometimes along the way things get skewed and you know they leave us to decisions and actions and thoughts that, again, we may not even agree with, but are less than innocuous. Let's 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 step back a little bit because people define bias in 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 different ways or different things that you can be biased about. So like what are <laughs> like when you when you think about bias, or you talk about bias like in a generalized sense. Like what are the kinds of things that you're talking about? So biases in general are thought processes. Let's start there. They are a way that our brain processes information, processes stimuli, processes just things that that go through through our awareness, memory, just things happening around our world. And one thing that our brain is really, really good at is picking up patterns. Sometimes we're actively picking up patterns as we go like... uh, You can see that, I don't know if you can see it, but this is line. So you can see that there is like an invisible line connecting these things, even though there's not a visible line because there is repetition of, again, the visual things behind my back. Sometimes those patterns emerge without without us necessarily knowing and seeing that there are connections between things. Uh, Like the classical example being given here is, um, let me actually separate take a step back before giving this example. Uh, But think about how as we grow up, we are constantly exposed to various types of information. We watch movies, we read the news, uh, we talk to people, we meet other people, depending on where we went to school or where we didn't go to school, we get to have different types of experiences. And all of this creates some patterns of information that our brain processes a certain kind of way. So, Again, the classical example being given here is if I say peanut butter, probably I'm going to warrant a guess because you mentioned that you're in the United States, you're thinking of jelly. There we go. This speaks nothing to me, however, because in my culture, A, peanut butter is a relatively recent thing because in Bulgaria, sure, you can find peanut butter in the store, but I wouldn't wouldn't necessarily say this is a Bulgarian thing. I think in my head, peanut butter is a very American thing. Jelly also, why does, what does jelly have to do with being a peanut butter? See, so to me, this doesn't make sense. But to you, there is this association. And the really tricky thing about our brain processing information is that it's trying to save time. Again, the overall, the, the overall reason why this happens is we cannot be very actively involved in processing every bit of pattern emerging or every bit of information we go through. If we were to do that, this is the only thing our brain should be doing the whole day. And again, we, we have to do other stuff. And in order for the brain to be able to do that, it creates shortcuts. So it clumps things together. It, it creates those associations, peanut butter and jelly being, again, the example that I gave. However, sometimes those associations and those clumps of information together create errors because yes, they are saving us the time to have to process all of this information. But if we are just going implicitly with this association that was created for us, we are not allowing ourselves the time to actually assess the the actual situation or the actual person or the actual event in front of us consciously. And the one thing I will say, because this is, my answer has been going on for a while, is that this is, A, it's very personal, B, it's very cultural, C, it's, it's based on so many things that we don't necessarily get to control. Some of our, my biases and some of the ways that I process information, I don't necessarily get to control, I may not necessarily be aware of, I may not necessarily even agree with. I may have a certain tendency to like some patterns more than others, for example, and have like a better reaction to some things than others. So... 
that this is this is why I started with saying that biases, by definition, they're neutral. They are shortcuts, but they're fallible, and that's where things get tricky. So, so that leads me to a couple different questions. Um, one, I really love the idea of referring to bias as neutral, right? Because, because what really interests me in this topic, right, is not just recognizing our own inherent bias. Because um, when we were all talking yesterday, like doing a little quick prep, right, we we. We talked about, or you said something that resonated with me. I'm just going to repeat here that um, the job isn't necessarily to that we face isn't necessarily to eliminate our biases. We can't get rid of them. Um, so it's instead, how do we recognize them? How do we be more aware of them? How do we cope with them and recognize them in ourselves and others? And and so the the thing that really interests me about this topic, and I guess about most topics that we'll probably talk about in, in on how to human is what that means for communication. How Not only how do, I, how do I human myself, but how do I human with all of you, right? And um, because bias not only creates problems for ourselves and whether we're making the, the best decisions based on our own internal biases, but they create communication challenges, right? Like it's it, because we will, you and I, Marianne, could, could see the exact same stimulus and come to two completely different uh, conclusions based on our own lived experiences and our own biases that we may not recognize have, and and both of us are convinced that we're right and the other is wrong, and you create an impasse. So, like, I, I'd love to spend time, like, first of all, and I'm sure we'll get into this, talking about you know, how do we recognize that in ourselves and others, and how do we communicate with others without <laughs> triggering the other person? Because, because, because the other thing about bias, um, sorry, now I'm getting long winded, but we we know this is how I am. Um, the other thing is when when you talk about how it's neutral, I love that because I think it's true, but what is the first thing, what's the first thing I'm gonna do if you counter something I'm saying to you? Because you're saying, well, it's just because of your bias. I see why you think that, it's because you're biased because you think of this and this and this. How am I, am I gonna say, oh, you're right? Or am I gonna immediately get defensive? You're telling me I have bias and you're telling me right now that that's a neutral thing, but what I'm, how I'm gonna receive it in the moment? Is that you're telling me there's something wrong with the way I think because I have bias? I'm gonna I'm gonna perceive potentially that um, you're telling me that my lived experiences are wrong, and therefore I'm biased, and and that has a negative connotation instead of a neutral one. So like, all of that is to say, I'm really interested in understanding how one we recognize in ourselves so we communicate better, and two how I as the recipient of information about my bias from the outside can receive that information better from someone else so that I don't receive that information negatively when somebody points out my bias to me. Does that all make sense? I, I ramble, I know, but like, I, but those are two areas that I think are really important. I think are hard for people. They're hard for me anyway. So Marianne, before you answer, uh, let us know, like I, I do see you have uh, a little bit of your screen shared. Let us know if you want us to, you know, bring that up at any time. Mm, um. I think I'll do that in, in a second. But okay. I, I just want to acknowledge straight from, from, from getting this discussion from Jeff that, again, bi biases, stereotypes, this way of us processing information, yes, they're neutral. But that doesn't mean that they always create a neutral effect. Again, the example with the peanut butter and jelly that's always given in academic settings, at least in my experience, uh, that, that's a very innocent one. That's an association, again, you mentioned you, you have. I don't necessarily have, but I have other food-related associations I can give that probably wouldn't resonate with you. However, this also applies to the way that we, we make these types of associations for people. And again, going with the psychological route again, you have this whole process of in-group, out-group division. What are the groups that we identify with based off certain qualities that we share or we perceive that we share with others? Now, this could extend to a lot of things. This could extend to background. This could extend to education. This could extend to the way that we speak a certain language. Uh, this, could ex this could extend to name, race, sexual orientation, the way that I dress, the way that I speak, the way that I gesticulate, as, the way that I'm waving my arms around. It, there's quite a few things that could create you feel you're part of one group but not part of another group and even more so another person being part of a group you specifically want to avoid so just because something is neutral doesn't mean it always could be inaccurate it, it, again in, innocuous it could be positive again seeing a, a quality and perceiving a quality that you associate with something good so you you recognize it and you want to 
again, you see this association with, with the group you like. Uh, I don't even know if that's the word. I'm imagining words as I go, by the way. Uh, which, by the way, again, right uh, parentheses, there is quite a bit of research speaking of biases that um, to native speakers, people who speak English as a second language with even a hint of an accent are on average seen as less intelligent and less competent. So this is an interesting thing to, to ponder. So bias can work in many ways, but let, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so this could be positive. Again, I'm implicitly liking a person more because they, they, I associate something I like there or something I share with them or negative. I specifically am already associating this person with something else because of media, because of my education, because of, uh, again, a pattern that even if I did not create, it was created for me be it by other people. This is like very abstract. I can give very specific examples. And I think this is my perfect segue to shut up for a second and share my screen. And I'm going to need your help for this. There are two pictures on the screen. And this, I want to give credit. This is from a, a TikTok of a professor of psychology by the name of Dr. Ina uh, Kanevsky. And she gives this wonderful example. If you have to make a guess without overthinking it, which of, the, which of these people do you think plays chess? And which of these people do you think plays basketball? You really want to, you, you, should I really answer this? I'm actually asking, yeah. All right, so I, I think that Mr. Tai looks like the chess playing kind of guy. And as do you with the Tai today. I uh, fail at chess. With chess, it's not about winning for me. It's about prolonging the lose. <laughs> How long can I wait for my big bad king? Yeah. So here's the thing. I don't know who plays chess. This is a rent. Both of the pictures are random stock photos I just downloaded. And it's really not the point of who actually plays chess. It's how we had an answer to this question as I asked it. Right or wrong doesn't matter. In fact, this is where it gets tricky. A lot of the times it's wrong. We just accept it as if it were true without testing it, testing it for ourselves or asking questions. Or again, it shapes our thinking and the way that we would approach this person. If I were to play chess, I would say, yeah, sure. I want to, I don't know, for whatever reason, maybe I like the chess guy better. Or maybe I don't because for whatever reason, I don't associate this thing I enjoy as a hobby and I want to associate with other people that share that hobby. And again, I could go on and on about this, but this is the crucial thing, how we are making decisions about people. Oh, oh so yeah, you can make a very valid point that the other guy plays chess as well. We don't know. It, which, which is or. Enough, the reason I highlight that comment, interestingly enough, is because that is in itself another form of bias, right? Like, you know, it, we're still, it looks like a competitive guy. I bet he's the one who wants to go out and win in everything he does, whether it's basketball, chess, wrestling, or, you know, whatever else. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, th this is this is really how again the point here is we're processing information. We're put in a I put you in a situation where without thinking, because that's what I said, make a snap decision. And now some people would recognize that again that this decision more or less is moot. But others would just go with it because again this is a very isolated, very fictitious, artificial example. But we're making these types of snap decisions throughout the whole day for a variety of things. Well, yeah. and it's also interesting because n not to bring it back to the thing I was talking about before, but but then not only do we make those assumptions, which could change the way we perceive that individual, but we could change the way that individual feels in the circumstances, right? Like, doesn't it seem like a silly comparison, maybe? But because you use basketball as an example, um, I had a friend growing up. I still am in touch with. I went to high school with. He's six foot eleven. I don't know how tall that is in meters. Many meters tall, um, but six foot eleven, and not necessarily an athlete. And the the frequency with which I would watch people walk up to him when we were growing up and ask him and start talking about, about basketball, ask him about basketball. I was like, I don't, I don't play basketball. And it would offend him. It got to the point where people would walk up when we were in high school and say, they'd say, wow, you must be really good at basketball. And he would look down at them and say, you must be really good at mini golf. Like, cause he didn't know, <laughs> cause he, he was just um, offended by the idea that people made those snap assumptions, right? So it creates a barrier right away. Like, right, it just, it just creates a barrier immediately. I feel like that happens with, uh, with women of a certain age, too. It's just like, you know, oh, tell me about your kids. And it's like, well, you know, eh. Yeah. Right. 
that's a huge one, right? That's actually a huge one for for a lot of a lot of professional women, right? Like that's a huge bias and a huge problem. I mean, I don't that that's a whole different conversation, um, but yeah, you're right. So, Marion, I, I hear what you're saying. Like a lot of these, you know, um, shortcuts that our brain takes are, you know, driven by how we have grown up or the situations that we have found ourselves in, and we're trying to get to those judgments, get to those decisions quicker. How do we open our mind to, you know, to dig in more? Like, which one of these two would, you know, play chess? Because we don't know on, on, you know, on surface. So, so, how do we open our mind to, you know? finding out more before we get to a decision? Now, this is an excellent question. And I know that I'm, this is probably the third time I'm about to say what I, I want to say, but the answer is actually very complicated. And I think when it comes to being human, one of the big thing to, you, to, you know, to connect to, to the title is if someone is giving easy answers, they're not telling the full story because being human is inherently really complicated. You have multiple sciences trying to figure out what, again, consciousness is or how our brain operates or why do we grow up to be who we are? Is it genes? Is it the way that we're brought up? Is it a mixture of two? And we don't have so many answers we still don't have. And I don't know if we ever will have them. I really hope we do, but there's still so much we don't know. And I think the there are a couple of things we can compartmentalize in order to answer this question, but it's not an easy question to answer. And if we treat it like an easy question to like, sure, attend this one training and you absolutely be rid of biases or you you would whatever, if it just sets the wrong, wrong expectation, it sets their expectation that there's something wrong that needs to be fixed. Sometimes there is. But I think with these conversations, for example, in the INZ sphere, inclusion and diversity sphere, a lot of the times when people think why we're talking about inclusion and diversity, they, they, their mind goes to the very, very negative experiences. They go to weaponized bigotry. They go to active aggression. They go to like this very vivid, negatively charged experience. But a lot of times it's much more subtle. It's much more, to give one example from my world, if, again, I'm a manager and I have a team of multiple people where am I spending my time to give feedback? Is it, am I focusing only to specific people or am I being equal? How am I distributing information in my team? Do I hang out with the people I actually like or am I, again, sharing this with, with the full team? Uh, when we think about how I develop or how I, I work, how I communicate, going back to Jeff's earlier point, and I still haven't answered that question, I know. So what I'm trying to say, it's it touches multiple different areas. However, to go now to what I think could be an answer here. I think the first very important step is to recognize that we all have our biases. So we first need to recognize how that works at a very basic level, what that is, to demystify it and de-demonize. Demon, demon, is that a word? Again, I'm making words up. There we go. Uh, demonize. Like demonstrify, and I'm like, that's not right oh. either. <laughs> now I like no, demonstrify. Yeah, demonstrify. Oh, yes. Oh, all right. There we go. So I'm maybe we'll my tail again, <laughs> Jeff. I'll take my tail right out. Oh, that sounded bad. I'm so stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. So I, I think, again, with with biases, how that works. We first need to understand what it is. We first need to understand that we all have them, so we can actually begin the again the process of introspection. And here is one additional thing what, what, that I want to you know, throw out there to give you some more meat to my answer of why I think this is a very complex topic. Um, when we're speaking of biases outside of the implicit bias, there is also this thing called uh, blind spot bias, where we, are, we have this tendency to notice biases of others, but not necessarily ourselves. We were like, oh, that, that's not about me. That's you know, someone else's problem. Because again, we tend to picture that when we think of biases, there's this usually very negative charged idea of what biases are. You know, I'm not a bad person. No one likes to be told they are a bad person. So that's the very first thing to start with. The, but when we think, again, one is understanding what biases are and what they're not. Another is to be very honest and introspective with ourselves. And this is something we can talk more about of just understanding where are my biases? 
what am I what am I more biased toward and more biased against? And I think feedback plays a super important part in this. Again, getting other people's perspectives of us, taking again stock and and finding something that we can measure and think about. Because as I said, the blind spot bias is very real. We tend to, if I asked you, again, do you have bias or whatever? You may say, no, I, I don't think so. Or I'm less biased than I think, but other people may have a different opinion about that. And I think the third one is to, I think, boil it down to that when I was thinking about if I have a snippet of the answer of how to human, I think that the shortest answer, sh- shortest answer I could give is the way to human is to give everyone respect. And if we go by our biases, if we don't challenge our thinking, we're not respecting the person. We're not respecting, again, this full complexity and this beautiful layers and layers of complexity that each person is. And, but again, and again, and, yeah. sorry, but like, and again, it's not, no, no, trying, it's not about cutting off or trying to eliminate our bias so much as just acknowledge it and acknowledge it in others as well. And, and um, you know, tying something back to our first episode, um, talking about the inclusion and diversity, um, and something you said a few minutes ago about changing the way we think about that even means and the reasons for it and, and not focusing on like the really catastrophic stuff. Like something I have, I, I have to work on this all the time. I'm really bad at it um, a lot of the time. Um, it, in fact, I even just now was bad at it again, is turning things around and choosing to use positive language instead of negative language. Um, talking about the exact same thing, but instead of, instead of talking about like, we have to do this thing because otherwise this bad thing happens is we should do this thing because then this great thing will happen. And so I think the same is true when we talk about bias and recognizing it in others. It's not like we have to recognize it because otherwise we feel like bad people. It's if I actually acknowledge my biases and I acknowledge your biases and Nicole's and Sam's and, and, and everyone else's who I interact with, I'm going to be better for it. I'm going to grow for it because I'm going to allow myself the opportunity to see through other people's perspectives and maybe come to a more holistic understanding of what I'm facing or what I, or a situation. And that's a positive way of looking at it. It's my bias is good because my bias is helping someone else understand things through my eyes and vice versa, instead of, I got to get rid of this bias because otherwise I'm treating this person like garbage. You're right. Like it's- I, I, I had, I had a, a something happen to me recently, which, which really makes me kind of think of this. So, you know, um, we were having a call with this person and I happen to know that this person just recently had a medical procedure done and was supposed to be on leave, but they joined a work call anyway. And they were being short-tempered and got off the call, was with the, one of the same people, but on a different call. And they're like, that person was being a jerk today. Like, what the heck is wrong with them? And I was like, in my, I'm like, I'm like, they're on a load of painkillers. Like, they shouldn't have even been on that call. They're on a leave of absence for a month and they're trying to do you a favor. You know what I mean? So like people, you know, they don't, they don't have that full picture. They don't see where other people are coming from. They're just like, you know, I, I I expect this behavior from you because I'm not seeing it. I'm making that negative assumption. Like, like you said, I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm going off topic. I'm going off topic. No, you're, no, you're not really I'm like, really I, going off topic. I, no, I use that exact same logic. Like, <laughs> strangely enough, like to avoid feelings of like road rage. I'm dealing with traffic, right? When someone's just cutting around and flying around and just being a jerk on the road and they're like, my instincts be like, what's wrong with that guy? Well, you know what? Maybe, maybe they're trying to race to the hospital to be bedside with, you know, their, their ailing, you know, you never know. And so like, it's, it, it, even in small every day, it's not about like the big biases of, oh, I saw, I had a conversation with Marian, but he had this like strange Eastern European accent and like he must not know what he's talking about he's probably like instead of having like those biases the big really bad biases it's the everyday occurrences right it's the everyday small things where bias creeps in that those are actually the ones i notice more is i think wow why did i just have that thought about that person that's probably not fair um and i yeah anyway uh, assume, actually what you just like, said I there like, I, I like this right here assume good intent yeah well blood pressure mm-hmm. yeah my blood pressure is probably not great because of that that's, I think, a great point, Phil. Thanks. But that example, I, I want to, you know, just cling to this example that you gave for a second and, and sort of unpack it a little bit because there's something very, very interesting in what you shared there about how the moment we start challenging our thinking of, oh, why is that? Why that? Why does that person maybe 
drive like this? Are they running late or whatever? This is this very interesting mind shift or, or of the way that our brain is processing information that you can see reflected in, in multiple advice that are given, for example, given when, for example, when we're feeling very strong um, emotion, for example, when, when, when we're very angry, you would usually get this very lived advice of, you know, count to 10 or, you know, breathe, understand your surroundings. What that does is you're challenging your brain to process information differently. Again, with biases, you're running to you're running with shortcuts. You put in limited time. You're making something. You're just processing information because you're put in this high impact situation. One way to challenge a bias or to challenge your thinking is exactly by that by really thinking: Why am I making this decision? Or why am I feeling this way? What could be driving the other person's actions? So just this very simple, uh, seemingly so at least, process of asking those questions first to yourself, self reflectively. And even more so explicitly, if you're talking to someone else, and for example, Nicole's example, this opens up the conversation. And rather than us having to rely on assumptions that are probably, the, the, the uh, again, the result of our brain processing information a certain kind of way, we're giving that person the respect to actually re um, understand that specific situation rather than making gross overgeneralization. So I, what you mentioned there, I, I found very, very insightful because this is really one very practical thing you could do to not always challenge your thinking, but to think about your thinking. And one more sentence about this, and I'll shut up, because I, I, I go on tangents as well. But the beautiful thing that we have as humans, as this the human species, is that we have something called metacognition. We can think about our thinking, which is a very, very evolved trait. And it's also something that requires, yes, a lot of brain power, but it, it's unique in our species that we know of, at least. Maybe in the future, there will be uh, research showing that animals have that as well. But my point was that thinking of why we're experiencing things, what we are experiencing, why we're about to make the decision we are, is a very, very power powerful thing. So questions are, to my mind, really, really well, yeah, and, strong. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a... It's probably cliche, but there's a um, there's a, a quote or a philosophical saying. I think it's from an Indian philosopher, Indian Swami. Um, says your perception of me is a reflection of you, but my reaction to you is an awareness of me. Right, and so exactly. I think that really speaks to the the uh, this bias topic quite a bit, and especially the thing we've been talking about just now. Right, is is how aware am I of myself? And how aware of myself can I be by paying attention to the way that I react to the things that you do and the way that you interact with me? Right? You just you I, said those words, and I want them on a little plaque on my wall because I feel like I need to I need to stop and I need to think about them. Like you needed to have a nice long, like here. doom style, dramatic, looking into the distance kind of pause. Okay. After so you wait, said so that. I will look off this way, and then I will hit enter since I'm allowed to post comments now. So Sam, I just, uh, <laughs> I'm going to do this, and then I'll do this for you. Oh, there Ooh. you go. That's a very good quote. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. I feel. I feel. A, a, I see, feel seen. Right. <laughs> there you go. No. So I. I, I want to uh, get back to the, uh, this thing that you know, Fool uh, said, said. This is so good. And you know, so often, like we we are averse to change and different, you know, mindsets, different, you know, ways of thinking. And I think like Jeff and me have said this a lot uh, when we are out and about um, with uh, with our developer communities. Like, what happened to civil discourse? What happened to you know ideas that you are not okay with or you don't like? Sit down, have a drink with another human, have a share a meal with another human, and we're not not all that different. It's just our you know our you know as we have grown up, the you know situations we have seen have not exposed us to the other side of this you know thought process or you know just difference in opinion doesn't mean one is good versus another all the time. Well, it feels like this problem is getting worse and worse by the day. At least now this is going to be an ethnocentric thing for me to say because I can only speak from like the American experience, right? And I'm sure this problem is elsewhere, but like American discourse in general right now, and that's only Sam and Nicole and I are in the States, like that that seems to get worse and worse by the day, right? We're allowing our biases in one area or another. Some of it's political, but it's not all political. There's a lot of polarization. And I think a lot of that polarization comes from the fact that we have biases. We hear one thing about an individual and decide that because of that one thing, um, whether that's political alignment, whether that is, uh, you know, views on diversity and, and gender or whatever, like all these things that have become polarizing for whatever reason in American discourse allow us to color what we think about that person in every other way. 
Yeah, um, I feel like it's gotten to the point where it's no longer I don't agree with you. It's you are now a bad person because I don't agree with you. Right, you're bad because you have this view. So it's interesting. I'm going to call this. This is probably who I'm going to call out Sean only because he's here watching and posting. Like Sean is a guy who uh, Sean Sparkman. Um, he and I have, I think, pretty different political viewpoints on a lot of things. John Mills as well, who Sam knows very well, who runs KCDC with me. Um, but they're two people who, like, I can have really great conversations about 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 most things, and and I'd like to think that we are able to um, find commonality instead of finding separation. But that's a very difficult thing with a lot of people today because of the biases that we receive. Oh yes, I love you too, Sean. See. Um, sorry for like calling you out and oh, ah, I did the thing, Sam. I tried to click it at the same time as you. You said not to do that. Um, but, but a lot of people can't do that today, right? Like I find out one thing about you and I decide, well, that person obviously isn't part of my tribe. I'm not going to try to learn from them. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to follow them on social media. I'm not going to engage with them. I don't want them to be in my social circle because like they have this one viewpoint that I don't agree with. And but uh, here's the thing, he, if, if I may, I don't think any of this is new. Any, I, I think if anything gets amplified because it's much easier to block people, A, on, on social media, B, it, you're, you're exposed to enormous amounts of information on social media constantly, it never ends. Sometimes even when you close your phone, it keeps blinking. So it constantly is engaging your brain. And again, when you talk about the more your brain is trying to get engaged, the more, because it's a lazy thing by definition, the more it's looking for shortcuts. So the more we're relying on biases. But again, in-group and out-group as a social phenomenon is not new. Again, if you think about it, the ancient Greeks, they had it, one of the, the most damning punishment they had back in, in their polis was, uh, again, where the word ostracism comes in English. When a person is being ostracized, they're being banished from that community. You don't, you no longer belong to our in-group. You're someone else. So I don't think any of this is new. If anything, it's amplified because it's constant. It is much easier to assume bad intent. And if anything, I think one thing that may be somewhat new is we really amplify things with dislike in a way my again in my experience at least I know I do that quite a bit but I, I don't have the patience a lot of the times to entertain things I know go against what I believe what I value or or what I know now is that good I don't think so but I know that I have the tendency to not want to engage there I yeah I I had an interesting conversation gosh this is years and years ago <clears throat> It was on a road trip to a conference. Um, I think it was with Jesse Phelps. I, I think is who it was in the car with me. I, where, um, where he was talking about tribalism um, and like the inherent nature, like like it, it's in our blood, it's in our genes, right? It's 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 in human nature to have in groups and out groups because it is in our nature going back tens, hundreds of thousands of years or, and beyond to like protect the end, to protect the group. We can't protect, uh, we can't protect our whole species. So we protect our group. We protect our tribe. We protect our family group or whatever. And so, um, so it is, so that's a hard thing to work against and to fight against, even though in, in it done the right way, it's really important in modern society to, 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 to handle. I mean, which again, I think goes back to the point that we can't eliminate these biases, which is kind of one of the underlying themes of this conversation is we can't, we can't get rid of it. So how do we leverage it to our benefit and for, for our own benefit and for the benefit of others? I, I want to pull up one other thing. I'm probably treading in dangerous ground here by popping this one up, but I, I, I want to, I want to ask a question about this because this is important. This, this is actually interesting. Okay, <clears throat> so wait, wait, wait. you said that as if nothing we've said so far has been interesting. Like I've been fascinated this whole time, and you're like, like this, this, this one thing, <laughs> one thing is interesting. Right. right. All this rest of the, that was all great. That's fine. That's one. That was all leading up to let's let's talk about anti-vax. No, so because <laughs> because I want to really cause problems for myself now. No, so um, serious. So here's my own bias. This comment got posted. And my immediate internal thought was, yeah, okay, like, I agree that we want to be friends, but come on now. 
and, right? That was my immediate bias. Is like, do you really want to be friends with the anti-vax person? And it's like, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, stop. So I had to stop myself because my immediate internal response was, right? And 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 I agree, like, I agree with, <laughs> done with the intro now, the gloves come off, right? So <clears throat> I agree philosophically with this comment. But then my, my practical response is, okay, that's cool. I can be friends with that person. I have people in my extended family who are anti-vax. I love those people. But, they're, but, but to me, now again, now this is just my personal view on the thing. To me, especially in earlier stages of this pandemic, when um, people were choosing to be anti-vax for whatever reason, it still makes me feel like, okay, but I don't necessarily want to be with those people physically because I don't necessarily want to put my own family or my children at risk. And then is that perceived as now I'm some like guy towing the line and just doing what, the, you know, and then even, even if I'm trying, the practical impact of, uh, of one person's bias or another means that like behavior has to change, even if how I feel about the person doesn't change. And can I have that, can, can you have that changed behavior and somehow navigate the, but I still like you and care about you as a person? Like I'm... I'm having a hard time articulating this because I'm, I'm not sure that I'm saying what, I, what I'm trying to say, but how, how do we handle the bias then in a way that's like, I respect that bias and those feelings, but I still have to change the way I interact with you because there are some practical considerations I think that means I need to, you know, does any of that make sense at all? I'm, I mean, there's, I mean, like what Marion was saying, like, none of this is new, it's just amplified, you know, there's, you know, nothing wrong with trying to protect your way of life, or, you know, your in group, it's just so easy for us to spew hate, uh, particularly, you know, when we are, you know, on social media, you, it's, it's hard to shout at another human being who's in front of you. It's so easy to shout when you're behind a keyboard, right? So I think it's just amplified, uh, you know, and, and the hate just, you know, spews, and it just, you know, you know, perpetuates a whole lot more. Yeah. So I think that we're really walking a very <laughs> tense rope of ways that this could be misinterpreted, like the whole conversation. Because I think the last thing anyone I'm, I'm hoping hears from this is that just because someone has an opinion, or just because someone has a bias, that's okay. Just because, you know, that's neutral, that's the way the brain processes information, da 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 da. Not Again, you, you probably have seen this picture. It's like it, it was a meme at this point, how you have like uh, a number on the ground and two people and how it's like one person sees this as a six and one person sees this as a nine. Both opinions are equally valid because it, it's you know the same thing to other people. However, someone actually went and wrote something initially that had its intended purpose. Yes, how we are interpreting that phenomenon, I'm sure is there, but there is still something, something, something objectively true that we can draw from. And this is my, again, long-winded philosoph again, philosophizing and continuing doing words that I don't even know if they're actual words or not, but I'm going to use if, them. If we know what you meant in their words, that's the thing, right? If we know what there you we go. I, I think it's, it's, what I'm hearing in this conversation is one question that I can, I, I think I'm in the capacity to speak of is, can we do something about our biases? And I think that the short answer, the easy answer is yes, we can. Now, where it gets more complicated is first we need to recognize them, but we do know that, uh, for example, I, I remember checking out as I was prepping this one survey, uh, sorry, not sorry, but research in 2008, which was, uh, again, it was in an American setting. So uh, one caveat there, it was about roommates and it was about having interracial roommates of, uh, again, um, white college students being paired either with another roommate who is white or with a roommate who is black. And what they found is that the, in, on the average case, as they surveyed before and after, uh, the people who were paired with an interracial, interracial roommate did lower, again, the, the score that they were measuring. with. So there was some effect there. Again, that's what we know research-wise. You can lower it. But the very important thing, I think, when it comes to biases, when it comes to our way of thinking, when it comes to setting boundaries and ultimately letting our biases lead our behavior and decisions is acknowledging why and how we're making those decisions or how we're how, why we're making the behavior that we're making. We're either doing so automatically without thinking, trusting our gut, 
or again, being impatient about something in, 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 in rushing or giving it its due diligence. And I'll bring things back to, to my world of, again, how do you think about networks at work? Because this is another example of just starting to think who is in group and who is out group. When we think about the people we communicate the most or we consider part of the network, there's a very clear objective audit you can do of who are the people that are part of your network. Is it skewed more in one direction or, or in the other based on a certain characteristic? This is objective, you can measure it. And you can focus to, again, make more connections in people of a certain characteristic you have underrepresented. However, and here's where I continue putting caveats to the caveats to the caveats that I'm saying. If you're doing this as like a Pokemon Go hunt of, you know, I should get two more American friends. Because again, I'm, I'm living in Sofia. Uh, sure, I talk to Americans, but maybe I need two more. Um, and you're just doing that out of this principle of just ticking a box. You're not respecting the human. You're over laserly focused on one quality. The point is being thoughtful and being curious of asking these questions and putting it, again, the goal should be, I want to understand more about something I don't know. I want to ask questions. I want to learn more. I want to expand my horizons. And this is my objective. And yes, how you get there is a whole other conversation we can have, but it starts by first identifying what it is you want to focus on. Okay, so... It's one thing to say, man, maybe, maybe, um, you know, gosh, I don't understand Bulgarian people. I need to make more Bulgarian friends is like not the best. Cause yes, that, I mean, it's tokenism at that point. Right. But maybe it's less about, I need to make some friends to put that check a box, but, it, but instead say, I need to immerse myself in that group or in that culture and understand perspectives, right? So for example, um, I don't know, here's, I, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but like, so, so, um, so I'm Jewish. We, um, my synagogue here has a number of times over the years done um, sort of collaborative experiences where we will um, either go to or invite people from other faith groups in other areas of the city um, into, into, uh, you know, into our synagogue to get to know each other. Not so much like a, Hey, we never think where we bring like a Muslim speaker to come talk to us so much as a, let's invite the Muslim community to come and join us for a Friday night service, or let's go and join them for one of their experiences, or let's have a social gathering together to get to know each other as a group to learn and immerse each other more in each other's culture. I do think it is true that, um, again, this is trite. Okay. But but it's um, but it, I think it's been shown in a lot of ver studies that, and you were just kind of alluding to it a bit too. It's a lot easier to have preconceived biases or stereotypes or just hate towards so somebody who you don't know. Absolutely, it's a lot harder Absolutely. to hate a people or a group of people if you know them. And I, and I would go one step. Oh, sorry, I, I'm interrupting. Oh, yeah, no, go on. I would just go one one step further. Even it's sometimes we think we know a group of people, but our thinking has been done for us because we're using again those mental associations we're just inheriting and just blindly adopting. Be it media, be it uh, politics, be it uh, what we see on the news. So sometimes we think we have very good understanding of a group of people without actually talking to the people or without learning about the people from the actual people. Uh, or, or from, again, whatever community out there that might be. So I think part of this is questions, part of this is challenging our thinking and just why am I thinking the way that I'm thinking? Is this, again, where, where is that coming from? What data do I have? So I think a lot of this is a practice in objectivity and thinking and in asking questions. So quite a bit of this is actually the scientific method that I'm so passionate about, having a hypothesis and rather than just going, yeah, this is true, just because I think it is true, actually testing it. And again, to your point, this could be meeting people. This could be joining a community. Uh, but it really depends on what is available in your network. Sometimes it could be as easy as reading a, a book or watching a movie that, uh, again, opens up another perspective that may be completely new to you. Um, 
or it could be again making a friend and asking them what they think or uh, or not really what they think but again just talking spending some time getting to explore and and and, and showing them that respect that i mentioned earlier at, at a very very ground level but yeah so 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 we have like not quite 10 minutes and one, one thing i <laughs> i i know we, I'm, See, we we could fill lots and lots of time with this. Like every every topic we do here, I think we could we could like have day long things. But um, <clears throat> so these are good ideas for how we start to inform ourselves better, to learn more about other people's perspectives, to help uh, not eliminate our bias but provide a counterpoint to our biases. But in order to get there, and in order to even know that we need to do that thing, like in order to immerse myself in like understanding another culture's or group's perspective or understanding first <clears throat> i need the awareness to know that i have to do that and i so like the awareness is still an important part and so like that brings me back to uh, th this is this is a fact i this is quiet for me nicole like this is quiet me um come on now so so um what are what are other ways like other than going up and sitting quietly in the mountains and meditating right which i would love to do weekly but i don't get to like what are the means we can use to even force ourselves to be more aware like how do we gain that awareness first so that then we know oh gosh i really seem to have a really negative bias or at least a bias that is coloring my perception of this group Mm -hmm. And like, so I need to go read that book or watch that film or meet these people or do this thing. What are the tools that we can do for ourselves and for others to help us in a, in a constructive way, gain that awareness? I know that's a hard and, question to answer. Maybe. And, and Mario, before you answer that, can I just, you know, add one more question to this? Uh, so all, all of this, you, 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 what you're, you know, uh, trying to lay on us is, you know, opening our mind and, you know, being objective as we, as, as, best as we can to ask why we are taking a certain judgmental decision that we are but you know this is a you know age-old bias in ai is, is where i'm going towards your work in in an hr in a people organization how do you um, live with the fact that we all have biases and now these biases are creeping into our decision making uh, mm -hmm. in an autonomous mode, uh, like I'm feeding data into my, you know, AI models that are inherently biased because uh, I am, it's my brain that's, that's choosing what, what data to feed. So how do, how do we deal with this individually to Jeff's question? And how do we deal with it when it comes to tools that uh, can, you know, inherit some of our biases? I love both questions. So maybe quite a few things I, I can, I can discuss here. I think that when it comes to the individual level, there are two things that at least I try to do. One is not only trusting my own perception of myself. As I said, the blind spot bias is there. I'm probably underestimating some of my biases that I have. Maybe I don't know even about half of them that are out there. So one is being very conscious in, in, in leveraging feedback. A, uh, by again, asking people, because I, I think ultimately what we want to do is we want to be less biased to be a better human, to be better communicators, to be connecting with more people, to be a better leader, to be, I don't know, a more robustly developed person, you name it. So I think one is asking people to give our honest opinion about how we do certain things. Granted, we need to build the right context where people would feel comfortable sharing that, which is no small feat in its own self, but feedback is one very strong tool to reduce our blind spot. The other thing, again, if we want to go more robustly research-wise, and I know this is something that Shirley mentioned the last time we were talking with her, you have the implicit association test that was developed by Harvard initially. If you Google IAT, you'll find it. It is, again, a tool that can help start this conversation to give you some idea whether you are, again, biased in one direction or not. I don't have the time to go into the scientific uh, conversation around it, which, again, not another time or the place, but this is a starting point. Another thing I believe this is very important, it also touches on Sam's point, is that when it comes to an organization, I'll talk about talent development because this is my field, this is my passion. Again, I, I, I really enjoy thinking and talking about this, but when we think of development, training is never the only answer, and one training does not solve everything. Again, if 
if your goal is I'll go to an implicit bias training and I will have all my biases fixed, I have very bad news for you and I'm sorry to disappoint. Similar to how if you go to one C-sharp session of 90 minutes, you don't come out as a C-sharp expert. It's pretty much the same thing. It has to be a continuous effort and a continuous clear idea of what it is you're trying to develop and understanding why you do. Because if you do it just to go and tick a box, by all means, you're not doing anything. Which is, in some capacity, why if you're doing this for the wrong reasons, it may only reinforce some biases rather than actually the development. So one is understanding why this helps you be a better leader, be a better colleague, a better expert, a better whatever. Um, another thing is to actually have more awareness of the systems that amplify biases and what you can do to minimize it. I think the, the one of the examples that is most top of mind for people is when it comes to recruitment, for example. How uh, Who are those pools of potential applicants that we go to? Are we biased to go to a specific, again, pool of people? Or are we actively trying to, again, um, pull as much as we... Is, is to cast as wide of a net, to use this metaphor, as we can. And what do we do as part of this process, as managers to, uh, I'll give a specific example, because I, I realize I may be a little bit abstract. One is, if I'm interviewing people, how, how am I identifying the questions? Am I asking the same questions to everyone part of my interview? Am I the only person in the room, or do I have different people from my team, each with their own perspective, uh, that, that can also ask questions and have another layer of assessment of that person. So being very conscious of what it is you're trying to uh, improve and uh, being very conscious of where you are right now and where you want to go and having, a, I think, a very honest first conversation with yourself of why you're in this field and why you want to develop that way and then just realizing who can support you. Because, again, the very final thing I would say is that Google has tons of resources for a lot of different topics. And quite a few things can be read, and, and this is a start. But where do we go after the start? This is a question that only, again, you can answer. Well, that was rolled up and tied, tied up really nicely right at 10 a.m. That, that's fantastic. You're a pro at this. So um, can, speaking of where do we go from here, um, before we let Sam, Sam is like actually the pro at these shows, like he knows how to open them and close them, whereas I will ramble for another 10 minutes. And so he'll just grab the hook and pull me off in a second. But um, can you provide us and everyone else who's either watching it now or who goes back, you know, we're going to publish this not only on Twitch, but we'll publish this on YouTube in a few days. Um, can you give get us a list? You can just shoot us and see your part of progress. You can shoot us a DM in Teams or something like a list of some good resource people to read. Like, I know you're an academic, so like some interesting academic things could be fascinating, but also maybe a couple of books or other things that we read that are more approachable for people who don't have the same depth of background and education in this area as you to like dig into this a little bit. If, if people want to read more and learn more about the topic, it'd be awesome because then we can share those resources uh, in the comments, both on YouTube and I think on the Twitch stream as well. Um, I mean, I want that because I want to read more too, honestly. Um, <laughs> So that'd be great. I'm happy to share. That's the shortest answer I can give. But I would also sort of challenge and tickle everyone here this question. What is one thing you're interested to learn more about? For example, I don't know. Is there a facet of humanity that you don't know enough or you haven't seen represented enough for you? Because just as, again, what would be a book or a resource that would, that out there could work for you. And I'm more than happy to share things that have worked for me, absolutely, but this is by no means going to be the exhaustive, robust, foolproof, 100% list. So for example, um, I don't know, when I first started working in progress, and this is the final sentence I say, I promise, when I first started working in progress and I first started communicating more, again, with a different culture that I knew less of, or I would say the majority of my knowledge of American culture was TV and Hollywood and movies and games and all of that, I made a point to talk to people, ask them for their recommendations of things that they found insightful to them, and then go there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's what I had to share. Yeah, uh, it's a lot of work. Yeah, you know, we can keep talking. I did highlight the um, book that uh, Rocket Man was you know, mentioning, uh, but uh, the bottom line is we all have biases. We can all learn more and just try to be better. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, 
Laser, Mr. Magoo, good to see you. Uh, yeah, we're all about chickens. I, th I think it's, uh, you know, it's December, you know, just like that. Uh, so I think we got to bring out our ugly sweaters and you know, holiday costumes and other stuff. So, Nicole, I'll, I'll try to uh, match up to your uh, costume thingy uh, next time around we meet. I have a I have a Telerik ugly sweater that uh, Meryl sent to me, but it was, she actually sent it for Jane, for my wife. So it's not going to fit me, but I will totally wear one. We just need to get Meryl to send me one in my size, which is much larger than my wife's size. Um, cool. Yeah. Also, just so everyone who's watching knows, like our first two guests, because yes, progress has come up a lot. And obviously Sam, Nicole and I, we were part of progress. And our first two guests have been progress people as well, uh, partially because we're trying to get this thing off the ground and understand, but it's not always going to be that. In fact, it's, it's likely we're talking about a couple of things, but uh, Check in with us in two, two Fridays from now because we're also going to have guests from outside of progress from around the industry. Um, Which, yeah, speaking of that, I haven't had a chance to tell uh, you and uh, Nicole, but our next uh, two Fridays from now, our guest is Arthur Dover, who is actually yeah. a community, community person. Uh, awesome. is amazing when it comes to talking about mental health. So looking forward to that. Awesome. I am tuning into that. Let me tell you. Marianne. Thank you so much, you know, for taking uh, an hour of your day uh, to, you know, come and chat with us. Thank you so much. We appreciate your comments. That's what, you know, keeps us going. Uh, it's what keeps us the, gives us the insight to, you know, ask more questions uh, from our guests. So thank you very, very much. Nicole, any final thoughts? Just any thank good? you guys for joining and I'll see you in two weeks. Two yeah. weeks. All right, folks. Thank you very much. Have a good Bye. day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take care.